Cyberhub Engage podcast is sponsored by Cyberhub Summit, hosting its second annual cybersecurity summit in Atlanta, Georgia, on October 10th, 2018, featuring a live tabletop exercise with audience participation, global speakers, engaging topics. Experience cyber different at www.cyberhubsummit.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Cyberhub Engage podcast. I'm your host, James Azar, and um, I've got a really, really important and special guest with us today on the show. Um, and I'll introduce him here shortly. But before I do that, I just want to remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Cyberhub Engage. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter, all at Cyberhub Engage. Or you can tweet at me personally at James underscore Azar1 on Twitter. And um, Follow us because we have a very special guest with us today, and it's Mr. John Felker, the director of the NKIC. Hey, John, how's it going? Good morning, James. Good to be here. It's awesome to see you. We spent some time together yesterday and um, at dinner, and so I kind of wanted to, first and foremost, let those who are listening who don't know what the NKIC is, what is the NKIC? Yeah, it's a good question because I, I think there's a lot of people that don't know. So the the NKIC is the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. It's a part of DHS. Um, our our major muscle movers in the NKIC are information exchange, analysis, incident management, and capacity building. And we do that with a number of different both fed.gov partners, uh, but also state, local, travel, territorial, and the private sector, particularly in the critical infrastructure space. So our, our objective is to not do cybersecurity, but to help you do cybersecurity better. There's a misconception um, about information sharing and information exchange. Why don't you clarify that? Because a lot of people kind of get those two confused. Sure. The, the, so so uh, information sharing is the technical term of art, and it's written into the legislation and so on and so forth. What we're trying to do is to get people to think more about information exchange. Information sharing, uh, if, we, if we say that's our mission, which it is, is we push information, which we do. But what we would like to do is we would like to grow that body of knowledge by getting information from our partners as well. So uh, I talk about it in terms of information exchange as a bi-directional sharing of information uh, between uh, two partners and, and as many partners as we can have. The idea is to create this larger body of knowledge that we can then use uh, in an analytic way uh, and bounce it off of some of the sources that we have that many people outside of the government don't have access to. Uh, and that's part of our value proposition. Turn that around into actionable, unclassified, uh, and timely information that cyber defenders can use right now. There is a, um, you guys obviously have multiple sources that feed you information. That's how you kind of push information out. But the private sector also needs to kind of feed you information so that you can get a full picture. How challenging is that for the NKIC? Yeah, it, it's a challenge in some cases. There are some private sector partners who are really great about this. Uh, they're uh, in the past year, there have been a couple of big multinationals that have decided that, that information is no longer a commodity. Uh, to to use as uh, as part of your business, it's it's something that should be freely passed back and forth. Um, uh, but there are still a number of of entities, big and small, out there that are very reluctant to share information with with us, with the government, despite the fact that CISA 2015 indemnifies them from from sharing information with us. Um, the the thing that I point out about our information uh, that we receive as well is that we protect that information um, just as if it was highly classified. So it's still your data. You're sharing it with us. That's a good thing. We're going to anonymize that and try to turn that into a bigger picture that we can then turn around and share with the broader community to have better effect in cyber defense. Um, you, when you see... Um and you look at information exchange, as you call it, which is a two-way streak. That's the whole point of an exchange, exactly. right? You exactly have a buyer right. and a seller per se, yeah. you know, in the financial sense of it. But in the cyber sense, you've got someone giving and getting information all the time. Um, as you know, you know, we're talking about this earlier, risks and, risks and threat increase and so forth. But you guys are actually able to 
provide information. I don't want to say ahead of time, but you're able to help people kind of mitigate that. You were talking about that a little bit last night, some of the stuff that you guys help companies with. What are some of those things? Yeah, so so we are always looking for the bigger picture in terms of information, particularly as it applies to threats trying to understand the, the way to mitigate uh, those threats, and then try to share that information uh, in a way that's useful to the cyber defense community. So before something happens, right? right. Um, we, there's, there's everything from vulnerability to ongoing threat, and all of that kind of stuff is in our portfolio of information that, that we want to have go back and forth between us and our partners. Um, so I think, you know, the, 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 the big thing that we really are focused on is um, taking the data sets that we have, matching them with some of our partners' data sets but that, that have been willing to share with us, and, and trying to get ahead so that we can predict when something happens rather than all the time being reactive to something that's happening um, whether it's wanna cry or not pet you or something like that we, we reacted to those some cases there were partners that were well prepared to deal with it you know and other cases there were partners that were not and as you know in the uk um, the health system took was a pretty big hit well it. they were they were not prepared i mean one of the challenges in in wanna cry was that there's regulation that that precludes um, uh, a, a hospital, for example, uh, of doing the updates on on MRI machine. That there's a regulation that requires that update to be conducted by the OEM, and so the OEMs only have a few teams, and so they they're way behind. So so what are what are the right things to do when you're stuck in a conundrum like that? I mean, we dealt with a we dealt with a major trauma center in the Midwest during Wanna Cry who did all the right things major trauma center only lost 15 percent of their overall capability we're still able to do trauma uh, responses they were still able to do some of their um, critical surgeries and so forth um, and the reason they were able to do that is they did they did a couple of things right they did patching as much as they could they segmented their architecture uh, to to keep things instead of in one big flat landscape of right. uh, attack service they segmented it and more importantly they practiced they exercised what to do on a bad day to include the CEO. So when it happened in this instance, everybody knew what to do. They did all the right things. They were to continue to operate. And that's one of the things that we try to push people for. And that's part of the reason that we do this information uh, exchange. That's a different discussion, right? Because that's the discussion of what I'm a big advocate for is that cybersecurity is a, is a, is a corporate responsibility to everyone in an organization. It's not just the CISO um, and, and or the CIO or the VP of cybersecurity or whatever you want to give them title, however you want to title them, right? It is really a corporate responsibility. And I think most of the time what falls between the cracks is the fact that, you know, what do you do when you're under a incident, an event? and you can't access any of your data. Yeah, well, I don't know what you do. I mean, right. <laughs> are you prepared to deal with that? We, we talk all the time about resilience. Can you continue to do your mission or your business while you're in the middle of a cyber event? If you can, that's good. If you can't, you gotta figure out how to do that. Um, and, and this hospital was a perfect example of that. And, and the point that you're making, James, about um, it's not just a CISO or CIO problem. Leadership needs to own the problem. Right. Up to and including the board of directors. Exactly. I mean, there's a, um, in the history of this podcast, I've spoken to many CIOs and CISOs. And the common challenge is always, you know, and, and you notice that in different sectors, right? Oil, gas, and financial, the CEO is involved in cyber. He is because he realizes that his that it's his liability. He's going to get fired if it goes down. He's going down with the CISO. But in other sectors, you're just not seeing that involvement. It's almost like, oh, I've got immunity. If I don't go, if I don't know, I've got plausible deniability. And plausible deni deniability essentially saves my tail regardless of what happens. That, that's exactly right. And, and, and that's, the, that's a mindset that I think we really need to change. You know, I, I say this all the time. Leadership needs to own the problem. They need to understand. Well, one of the biggest, um, you know, things about information exchange is the liability aspect, right? Corporations are very scared to give you that information. Well, not you personally, but the end kick, right? 
Um, mostly afraid to give it to the government. Well, yes. That's one thing. That's one factor. The other factor is if they give it to anybody, they're reluctant because they're afraid it's going to open them up to liability if they've done something wrong. And, and I understand the OGC's principle of protecting the, 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 the interests of the company. I, I got it. However, if you're going to close the doors like that, you, you really need to have your stuff in one sock, right? right? Um, and there are very, very few entities that do. This is a team sport. This is something that other people can help you with. And as I said right. earlier about protecting your data, when you give it to us, we take that really, really seriously. In the three years that I've been in the NKIC, we've, we've screwed up on that twice. And in both cases, I personally talked to senior leadership in those entities and uh, apologized. They were they were very understanding. I mean, look at you're dealing with all this stuff flying right. around. You have the policies and procedures in place. You follow them. Sometimes, God forbid, things things, things will fall through the cracks. So we need to be prepared to take responsibility for that, and we do. There's a uh, you know what you just said is astronomical because. Um, you know, typically people say government organizations prone to mistakes, prone to mishandling information. Um, you guys have a lot of successful partners. So for those who are listening now who are CISOs, CIOs, who want to be part of the information exchange with NCIC, what are some of the uh, best practices or tools that you've seen other partners of yours use to get over the legal general counsel's kind of like objections to information exchange yeah i've seen it in two ways the first way is the 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 it takes work but it's the easier way and that is you just have to continually work on developing relationship with those that you that you trust or that you want to trust because this is all about trust right uh, the other way is when you have a really bad day and, and a bunch of people get fired <laughs> and you figure it out that hey we got to do something different um, you know, we're dealing with a couple of companies right now that, that are in that boat. They, they, they got their butts handed to them, um, and we're trying to help them understand what they need to do going forward because they have significant exposure in the federal government where it gives us a little bit of leverage to kind of look at it. But, but these, these, both of these entities have been really good partners. They understand that it needs to change the way they do things. This is not a legal question. This is an operational question. This is how do we do better? How do we do business better? And still, I, you know, protect the, the interests of the company. You're actually, from my understanding, you're actually able to classify specific data and allow the party that gives you that information to essentially tell you how to share it and what manner to share it. That's right. Now, be careful about classify because you use classify and all of a sudden people think that you've given it to the government and all of a sudden we put a classified label on it and we can't share it anymore to anybody else. That's not the case. The, the, um, the first organization, which is an international organization of of um, uh, incident responders uh, has a protocol called the traffic light protocol um, and it, it goes from red to amber to green to white um, red being the highest so if you want your data shared only with us you put a TLP red label on that data and we don't share it anywhere else we use it for our purposes we don't even anonymize the data and push it any further until you let us do that um, any data that we push is always going to be anonymized. And, and I, I mentioned a couple of screw-ups that we had in the last right. couple of years. That was the case. We, we missed something in, the, in a treasure trove of data uh, that, was, that could, could identify the particular entity. So, so TLP Red, we treat very, very seriously. It's not classified as a handling protocol. We're only going to handle it internally. Um, TLP Amber means that you're willing to let your data go more broadly, but it's going to go within a trusted community. Uh, and TLP Green and TLP White mean that you're comfortable with the data going to a broad set of our other partners, vetted and unvetted. Uh, so if you walk down those layers of, of the traffic light protocol, that's sort of what it means. And that's how we protect your, your data and your interests when you share it with us. How do people, how can... Someone who's listening to this, who is just now finding out about the NK, get more information about the organization and be a part of it in terms of information exchange. What, what are some of the things that it takes? Yeah, so, so the, the best way is there's a, a website. Uh, it's a U.S. CERT website. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find it. Um, and the, the steps to establishing a partnership with us from a corporate perspective are, are kind of laid out. Um, there's an there's a email address in there to send to. Uh, and then somebody from our staff or the CSNC staff will follow up and help 
help you walk through the process. Uh, I'll tell you too that the process has gotten a lot easier in the last uh, couple of months because we've changed from a concept where we have a CRADA, which is a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, which is viewed as a contract to what's called a CISCA now. And I don't, I don't remember what the acronym means, but it's an easier document to deal with. People can Google it. <laughs> People can Google it, right. Uh, it's, it's an easier document to deal with. But basically what it does, it sets out the terms by which we're going to share information, what you agree to as a partner, what we agree to as, as a partner, and we go from there. And, and lawyers generally are pretty good about understanding what that means. In fact, we've, we've had a bunch of different folks have vetted this. And, and so go to the U.S. website, look for partnerships, and, 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 and send an email to that address, and somebody from the staff will be in touch with you to work you through the process. So the NCAC is part of Department of Homeland Security. And Secret- right. Secretary Nielsen recently announced the National Risk Center. How is that different from the NCIC? A National Risk Management Center is, um, is, is different in that the, the Risk Management Center is looking at uh, how to characterize and better understand uh, existing risk before an event. So, for example, um, uh, in this current circumstance with Hurricane Florence, the, the NRMC um, has developed a bunch of, of products that tell us where critical infrastructure is, what the risk is that an infrastructure based upon the path of the hurricane, whether it's wind or water, um, if that entity uh, goes down, what are the downstream connected effects of that entity going down? So, for example, you got a hospital, but the power goes out. How, what's going to happen? How are we going to manage the hospital? And then you can start planning ahead for um, coverage for that hospital if the hospital is going to go down due to an electric outage. So so the, the, the risk management center is looking at those risk things up front, understanding what those risks are, how they're connected. Part of that is is a cyber risk. What's the cyber risk? What's the downstream effect of, a, of an electric station going out to the comm sector, for example? So they're looking at all that. That feeds then into to our preparations for when the bad day actually occurs, um, how do we structure our response and where are the priorities with our private sector partners for, for reconstituting the capability to do communications and things like that. Make sense? Absolutely. You guys, as an NCIC, you guys have cross-government sharing, correct? So it's not just DHS, it's DOD that's involved. That's right. It's that's the law enforcement agencies exactly and others, right? right? Yep. Yep. So you guys are getting feeds from all of them, and then that's the information that's a lot of time exchanged to some of the partners in the program. It exchanged in an anonymized way. You don't know where it's coming from. We have a big bunch of data that came from all departments and agencies. We, we look at it from a, a term, uh, um, the perspective of utility, because uh-huh. uh, we're not going to push stuff out just because we have it. We're only going to push it out if, it, if we think it's going to be useful for the cyber defense community. So we get all that data in it, we put it together. That's, our, that's the analysis leg of what we do. Uh, so we do the analysis. We we compare some of that analysis with both our government and private sector partners to make sure we're not going to put something out that breaks stuff or causes a lot of false positives, that kind of deal. And then we then we push it out. So that, that that's the way that it's it works in and out of, of that information. How but, do you how do you guys assist an organization when they're in the middle of an event? Because you were talking about the hospital yeah. in the Midwest and you've spoken yep. about a few others over the last few days. And so um, what are some of the roles you guys can help them with? Um, so we we have uh, a hunt incident response team um, and to, to give an example over the past couple of months our hunt team has been um, really focused on uh, helping state and local partners understand uh, what their election infrastructure looks like and so we we go out there some really high speed low drag players on our hunt team that'll go out and they'll get into your network and they'll look for bad guys they'll look for anomalies they'll look for vulnerabilities all that kind of stuff and help help you understand what your network looks like, and then help you with um, putting the things in place to, to, to be more secure in that environment. So we, that's the proactive part, that's the front end part. If there's an incident, well then we have our incident response team, which are essentially the same guys and girls, uh, and they will come out and they will help you walk through uh, uh, what happened in an incident, help you understand it, help you continue to operate while while the incident is occurring, if it's still occurring, uh, we, we've, we've probably done, 
well, I don't know the exact number, but we've done a whole stack of them just in this year alone where we're, we're out. And, and there's two advantages to that. Number one, we're helping the critical infrastructure sector uh, maintain. We're helping them learn how to do better at it. We're also, we're also gleaning a lot of uh, knowledge from those engagements where we have data, We've had hands-on uh, a bunch of different kinds of networks so that we can think about how do we do this better in the future, both from a reactive and thinking towards a more proactive stance uh, about how we, um, how, we, how we go after that kind of, kind of problem set. In the last three years under your leadership, the NCIC has obviously grown. Its role has ballooned a little bit more. It does more than, than it did before, obviously. Um, where do you see it going in the future? What can companies who joined NKIC expect? What's their roadmap look like for the organization? And so so the, the big thing that we're trying to figure out how to do is to make better use of all the data that we have. Um, quite honestly, we're in my view, we're only scratching the surface. Um, we, we're working with a bunch of different partners to figure out how to better use the data holdings that we have. Um, and that, that's going to lead, I, I think, uh, to um, being, uh, being able to predict rather than react. Uh, and I, that's where I think we want to try to get. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, but um, with the partners that we have both in the federal government, the state governments, the local governments, and the private sector, that, that sort of data, the, the, the data holdings, the different thought processes that people go to based upon sort of what their environment is, um, as we move forward, I think we're going to get better at understanding the totality of our data, using it, and then trying to be um, a lot more uh, predictive rather than responsive. Predictive? Uh, maybe, maybe not responsive is good. Reactive. Reactive. Yeah. So the, the biggest challenge for every CISO, every CIO, every organization, period, is being, uh, being ahead of the attack, the incident. That's the holy grail, isn't Th it? That is the holy grail. Um, and so I in your head, you're trying to bring the organization it, it, under your leadership better yet. You're trying to bring the organization to the point where how can we use these data points to instead of being reactive to be proactive and warn people ahead of a storm. That's exactly Kind of right. like Florence. We're thinking through that, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's the, that's the advantage that the physical uh, crowd has is they see a storm coming. Right. right? They know uh, pretty much on these major wildfires, they know how it's moving. Now it changes, obviously, but, but a cyber event comes out of the blue in a lot of cases. What we want to try to do is make that happen less. We can, we can get a sense that things are starting to happen uh, and, and put, put measures in place to, to prevent uh, bad things from occurring. And so meaning, and I'll, I'll kind of move this to layman terms slightly. Um, what, what you're essentially saying is, hey, we're trying to get, the more data points we get, the more we're able to paint a better picture. That's right. The better picture we paint, the more information we can get out to our partners, which can warn you of something that might be happening so you can patch, you can prepare, That's you can the concept. Set, exactly. your, set, your, uh, set your contingencies in place and really be able to prepare yourself for that black day that's, that's right. that might be looming around yeah, the corner so if we you know if we go back to want cry for uh, it's it's a it's a fair example i mean if if we had a sense and what well, we did to a degree but we had a sense that want cry was was happening i had a sense of what it was we could go to people and say hey wait a minute have you guys patched this vulnerability that's been out for a while you know the smb version one uh, vulnerability that had to be patched if you haven't you should do it right now because this is already happening in in europe and you know want cry sort of followed the sun right right um so so those are the kinds of things where we can get ahead of things and one of the reasons i think besides um, we had some folks that were better prepared. Um, what was we had advance notice that this was happening? That was already happening in in Europe, and and we noticed about we we had noticed from our European partners early in the morning of the, of the day that it was occurring in May, and 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 we were able to get the word out pretty rapidly so people could defend more effectively. So you guys do have European partners and and partners all we over partners the globe all over the world. that help yeah. you. We have partners so, all over the world. So so your information, even though it comes out and it's anonymous, meaning when you exchange information, it's anonymous. So it's you don't know where it's coming from unless the the party who gave you that information says let everyone know it came from us. Yeah, and that's that's usually a pretty rare occurrence. I mean, you, usually they they share with us. They want it to be anonymized in every instance, uh, but they're cap they're happy to share it broadly. So, boom, here's the stuff. Here you go. This is what we did about it. It's not really that important. You know who, right? Right. 
Um, and so some, but there are some cases where people will say, yeah, just tell everybody it was us. And, and by the way, we, we should be talking to others in our sector, in our critical infrastructure sector that, that are, are potentially at, at risk for, for this thing that's happening. You kind of say, you know, people want to stay anonymous. They want to stay kind of behind the curtain. Um, and, and some people don't mind sharing their, their kind of their information and letting people know what they do. Um, do you find that when you do share the company that gave you this information, excuse me, let me go back for a second here. I'm going to ask you a different question though. How's information verified? Before you push out information, what's the, you don't have to describe the whole process, obviously, because I'm sure some of it is, 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 is proprietary or it may not be public knowledge. But when I get information from the NCIC, when I sign up, how do I know that that information is good? Well, um, part of it is based on trust. Part of it is based on the fact that we'll take a close look at it analytically before we push something out the door. Okay. Like I said, we have a process that we, we get information in, we look at it for, for its veracity. Um, we, in some cases, we might have enough time to, to try it out in a sandbox to see that it really is bad juju. Um, and and we'll, we have a regular dialogue with that partner who shared it with us to, to, to get a sense of what's really happening. It's not... It's not likely that they're going to share stuff with us sort of like um, the sky is falling. Right. Um, um, but when that has occurred before, the checking process has sort of, you know, sort of slowed that down. I, the last thing I want to do is is call the sky is falling unless it really is. Um, and then that that's, a, that's a bigger problem. Let's pray we don't get to that day. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. John, um, I, we're a little short on time, so I just want to say uh, thanks for being with us today. I really do appreciate it. Um, like John said, the end cake, you can get the information on the U.S. cert. We'll post that under this um, podcast so you guys can actually click, and we'll post the link so that you guys have that. I just want to say thanks for being here, John. It's my pleasure to be here, James. Very much appreciate it. Awesome. All right. You're listening to the Cyber Hub Engage podcast. We're going to be right back after this message. CyberHub Engage podcast is brought to you by CyberHub Summit. CyberHub Summit is the leading executive cybersecurity education forum hosting their second annual event in Atlanta, Georgia on October 10th. You can find out more at cyberhubsummit.com.